Canada got into the nuclear industry on the ground floor. Much of the uranium used to develop the first nuclear bombs for the top secret Manhattan Project was mined in Canada by Satu Dene people in Delaunay Northwest Territories. And Chalk River, Canada's first nuclear reactor facility, was involved in producing plutonium for the Allied Weapons Program. Today, Canada no longer supplies uranium or plutonium for nuclear weaponry and has signed the United Nations Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But Canada's involvement in nuclear energy continues. Currently, about 15% of all Canadian electricity is produced by six nuclear power plants, five in Ontario and one in New Brunswick. And the nuclear reactors at those plants produce nuclear waste, waste that doesn't have a permanent home. And that's why Canada's nuclear energy industry is looking for partners. The search for a place to store our most toxic nuclear waste is the job of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, or NWMO. A not-for-profit corporation created by an act of parliament, the NWMO is funded by Canada's nuclear industry players. Its goal is to find somewhere in the Canadian shield willing to host Canada's growing collection of used nuclear fuel, which will remain radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, but theoretically safe from the outside world in an underground facility that will eventually be sealed off. The concept is called a Deep Geological Repository, or DGR. And a big focus at the NWMO is engaging with indigenous communities in areas under consideration for a DGR. Bob Watts is the Vice President of Indigenous Relations for the NWMO. He's long been a major player in indigenous politics and has had high-level positions with the Assembly of First Nations and the federal government. Watts is Mohawk and Ojibwe and lives on the Six Nations Reserve, where he's from. From a safety point of view, I feel really good about it. I feel really good about living on top of where a DGR is because I'm convinced of the, of the safety case. Uh, I think there's a whole bunch of other social factors uh, that would be need, need to be taken into account in terms of uh, our community and our rights and how that gets expressed more generally. But in terms of would I, would I live where there's a deep geological repository, I think absolutely I would. Watts isn't likely to have to live on top of a DGR, but we asked him about that to test his belief in the safety of the concept. If a DGR is built, where it's located will depend in part on the support and consent the NWMO gets from the area's indigenous people. The NWMO is currently engaging with communities in two areas in Ontario, Ignace and South Bruce. Exactly how much regional Indigenous support and consent will be needed to green light the DGR is unknown, according to Watts. What if something like this happens? What if the township of Ignace says, go ahead, but one or more First Nations communities in the area say, no way? So. One of the things that is going to be important to us, and in particular uh, with respect to the scenario you've identified, um, is to have confidence that we can go ahead with the project. And in some of the areas uh, we've identified indigenous communities uh, that may be in really close proximity to the project, and we've made it clear to those communities that we're not going to go ahead without their support. There may be other communities that may be further away from a proposed site that we'll need to work with communities and figure out what, what does that mean in terms of not being supportive. Um, and we haven't got to that place yet, but we recognize that we're not going to have 100% support. The NWMO trumpets its Indigenous partnership efforts proudly. They have an advisory council of Indigenous elders and youth and have even produced an eight-part video series on reconciliation. Truth and Reconciliation Commission called it cultural genocide. 
we're at the early part of that process of reconciliation. Not just Indigenous people need to know about this, but um, everybody needs to know about it. It's the history of Canada. Did all Canadians have a role to play um, as advocates? So if this doesn't happen overnight, we still need to keep on working at it, and it's going we to We can make better. a future better, and that's where we play a big role. And to recognize that it has generational effects. Is there recognize the historic wrongs that was done to us as children? Um, but now it's an opportunity for us to show that we're serious and truly be part. Why did the part. wrongs happen? What caused it? What can we learn from it? So it would seem that respectful consultation is part of what the NWMO believes will be needed to convince Indigenous people that a DGR is the best plan for Canada's high-level nuclear waste. It's a plan Mark Gobian knows well. I work for the Safety and Technical Research Department at the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. And when we visited the NWMO, he showed us what will be going into the DGR. So this here is a can-do uh, fuel bundle. This is what would actually go inside a nuclear reactor. When it comes out, out of the reactor, um, it actually looks exactly the same, except it would be quite hot thermally and would also be radioactive. So this is an actual size block of what the, the bentonite buffer blocks would look like. It's wrapped in plastic right now. This is just to prevent it uh, from any sort of deterioration while it's in storage here. Uh, and the room's at such high humidity uh, to keep that clay material nice and moist so it doesn't dry out, crack, crumble. Can I touch it? Go ahead. <laughs> so it's wrapped in plastic right now, um, but you can feel that it's quite strong. It's actually like a uh, soapstone uh, in terms of its strength and durability. Uh, the way that these are actually manufactured is we take bags and bags of bentonite powder, we place them inside a big mold, and then basically put that mold inside a, a really high pressure chamber that forces the block uh, to come together. It's actually in a pressure cell uh, where we manufacture these ones. It's actually a pressure cell where they test uh, submarine components. The purpose of a DGR is to protect the environment from the radiation which will be emitted from the nuclear waste for a very long time. It potentially does that three ways. One, by giving it time, that is many hundreds of thousands of years for its radioactivity to decay. Two, by putting a lot of distance between the waste and the surface environment. And three, by shielding the waste with what the NWMO calls its multiple barrier system. By the NWMO's theory, multiple barriers should eliminate any possibility of the nuclear fuel being moved back into our environment via water. So this is an example of one of our copper-coated containers that would, the fuel would actually go into um, underground. The first barrier in the NWMO's multiple barrier system is the fuel pellet itself. The pellet is a high-density ceramic made from uranium dioxide powder and does not readily dissolve in water. The second barrier is the fuel element and the fuel bundle. The tubes or fuel elements contain the fuel pellets and are made of a corrosion-resistant metal called zircaloy. The third barrier is the used fuel container. The NWMO's container will hold 48 used fuel bundles, and it's composed of a steel structure which the NWMO says can withstand the pressures of the overlying rock and loading from a three kilometer thick glacier during a future ice age. The container is also coated in a thin layer of corrosion resistant copper. Barrier four is bentonite clay. Each used fuel container would be encased in a casket like box made of bentonite clay. Bentonite clay is a barrier to water flow because it swells when exposed to water. As well as the bentonite clay casket surrounding the used fuel container, open spaces in each underground chamber will also be filled with bentonite clay. Barrier 5 is the geosphere, that is, the sedimentary or crystalline rock formation into which the DGR will be excavated. So as Mark Gobian and the NWMO see it, 
a lot would have to fail before water could access the used fuel and cause problems for us on the surface. In order to get any sort of release of radioactive material, you'd have to have that water move through the rock. It'd also have to move through our clay bentonite barrier. It would also have to somehow penetrate our steel and copper canister that's very durable and corrosion resistant, as well as uh, penetrate these bundles and dissolve that fuel itself, which is a ceramic material. It's extremely durable. It all sounds very safe and well thought out. That is, maybe until you hear from the guy who's probably the nuclear industry's most prominent critic in Canada. Well, here's the bottom line. We don't know what happens in the bowels of the earth. When you excavate a cavity underground, you create a, a room which is that atmospheric pressure. But the surrounding rock is a geological pressure, which is far greater than the atmospheric pressure. The result is that these, these uh, repositories are all going to be flooded with water without fail, because the pressure differential between the rock and the space is going to be filled with water. Coming up, we'll hear from Gordon Edwards, who, as you can tell, doesn't care much for the NWMO's plan. The NWMO wanted to organize a meeting with the Inuit, and the Inuit said, no, no, no. You give us the money, we'll organize the meeting. Yeah. And they took the money and they invited Bob and I, as well as the NWMO people. Gordon Edwards is the president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. We met December 2019 in Peterborough, Ontario, where he's giving a talk at a school about what's going on at a factory right across the street. These school children here at Prince of Wales School, behind them, very close, is a factory. You see that smokestack there. Um, that factory produces uranium fuel bundles for use in the Kandu reactor. Edwards has an academic background in math, physics and chemistry. And with a PhD attached to his name, he's held his own as perhaps the biggest thorn in the side of the Canadian nuclear industry. At one point, even defeating Edward Teller, the father of the H-bomb, in a 1974 episode of The Great Debate, hosted by Pierre Burton. The point is that we have to put them into places where they will not get around, there are several good ways to incorporate them, let us say, into rods, which are not unbreakable, but which will not pulverize if broken, and then put these rods into strong containers. If you break such a container, you have a nuisance, not a catastrophe. If a reactor goes wrong, you do have a catastrophe. And that is why I am trying to differentiate between these two types of danger. I try to be brief. I would like to bring you Just a minute. Dr. Teller makes the point that you can put it all in rods, put the rods in containers, presumably bury them, mm -hmm. and uh, in his view, th that makes it safe. Mm -hmm. for the let, next, me, let, uh, me, let me tell you a bit, Pierre, about the, about the history of waste storage in the United States. In 1969, the United States General Accounting Office reported that there were 93 million gallons of high-level waste stored underground in three states. These are in stainless steel and concrete containers which have their own cooling systems and they said that these things would have to be cooled and guarded for more than 600 years. Dr. Teller, do you want to comment on that? They also said that 18 of these tanks have been found to be defective within the last 25 years and some 227,000 gallons of high-level waste have already escaped into the soil. Edwards says the nuclear industry is being dishonest in presenting the deep geological repository concept as a certain and safe solution. So we are facing a situation where we have an industry that wants to convince people by hocus pocus that it has solved a problem that it has created which is beyond its power to resolve. It does not have the power to solve this problem. We should begin with a process of honesty. We should admit that underground repositories have failed and that this one might fail. Canada is not alone in pursuing a DGR. Many other countries are working toward implementing a DGR as their long-term solution for dealing with nuclear waste. But as Edward sees it, there are issues. 
I think it's a it's an interesting concept that's had a lot of work done on it, but the difficulty is that so far we have no evidence that it works. In fact, in Germany there were two deep geological repositories for radioactive waste which have both failed. One of them is uh, called the ASA 2 project. It was an abandoned salt mine originally and Germany decided years ago that this would be a deep geological repository for radioactive waste, not even the high level waste that they want to put underground for NWMO, but lower level waste which are called low and intermediate level waste. Then they found out for the last 20 years this waste has been leaking into the groundwater and reaching the surface water and contaminating the environment. And then there's the eons a DGR is meant to keep us safe from this material. Humans have simply never built anything that's lasted as long as a deep geological repository needs to last. You have to realize that the pyramids of Egypt are only 5,000 years old. Go and look at them. They're, they're really deteriorated a great deal. The, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. Uh, the Great Lakes didn't even exist 24,000 years ago. So uh, we're talking about periods of time that dwarf the span of human history. But what could go wrong if, say, we're entombing this material in bedrock that hasn't shifted significantly for a couple of billion years? We do not know how to put a geological formation back together again. Whoever saw a mountain being mined and then reassembled, reassembled back into the original integrity that it had before it was disturbed. We cannot put waste into an undisturbed geological formation because we are going to disturb it. When we disturb the geological formation, it's no longer undisturbed. Now, when you excavate a cavity underground, you create a, a room which is that atmospheric pressure. But the surrounding rock is at geological pressure, which is far greater than the atmospheric pressure. The result is that these, these uh, repositories are all going to be flooded with water without fail because the pressure differential between the rock and the space is going to be filled with water. And Edwards is also not buying the idea that the NWMO's multiple barrier system will protect us. You can put barrier after barrier after barrier. That doesn't mean that you have a safe system. They do the same thing and the same multiple barrier system, the same multiple barrier philosophy is used in nuclear reactors. They say the fuel is inside metal tubes which are called uh, zirconium. Uh, that's another barrier called the sheath. And those are inside pressure tubes which is another barrier. And then that's inside a calandria which is another barrier. And that's inside the reactor building which is another barrier. Consequently there cannot be a nuclear accident. Well, we've seen what happened with that philosophy. Chernobyl exploded and they, the whole area around Chernobyl is still uninhabitable and will be for at least another hundred years. Fukushima, we had three reactors melting down uh, on the same weekend and uh, um, those multiple barriers were all in place. They didn't work. And that's called uranium dioxide powder. And as well as having major doubts about a DGR's potential to do what it's meant to do, Edwards also warns of what he calls the joker in the deck. And the joker in the deck is that if you look at the waste from the Kandu reactors, about 1% of that waste is plutonium. Uh, that's a byproduct, and uh, a man-made radioactive material, which also happens to be the most powerful nuclear explosive. It's the nuclear explosive material that's used in most of the atomic bombs and nuclear bombs today. Edwards is concerned that the NWMO's estimated $23.6 billion cost of building a DGR might help create a desire to monetize. And the question is, how do you generate revenue by burying waste? There's only two ways to do it. Either you accept waste from other countries, so you, you become the garbage can of the world for nuclear waste, or you sell something from the waste. And the only thing you can sell is the plutonium. So reprocessing the plutonium is going to be a strong incentive for the nuclear industry. And the people who are being courted for as willing host communities, they're not being told this. And so I believe that there is a joker in the deck. And that joker in the deck is based on the fact that the people running the program have two agendas. And their first agenda is not safety. Their first agenda is continuing the nuclear industry.
The NWMO does, however, state very clearly in their information that no foreign fuel will be placed in their DGR. The NWMO also tells APTN Investigates that they will never, under any conditions or circumstance, contribute used nuclear fuel to a weapons program of any kind. They also say, if in the future Canada chooses to use plutonium for small modular reactor fuel, it would be a joint decision by the nuclear energy producers, the associated provincial governments, and the federal government, not the NWMO. If such a decision was taken, the NWMO would work with utilities and government to safely manage whatever high-level fuel waste resulted from this process. So, what is a better option than a DGR, according to Gordon Edwards? In a nutshell, wait and see if we come up with a better way of dealing with it. So, we can afford to wait another century or two and see if we can come up with a genuine solution. If we can't come up with a genuine solution, we can continue to look after it, we can continue to transmit the information, we can continue to repackage it periodically into better and better packages. This is called rolling stewardship. And if there is leakage that occurs, failure of containment, we can spring into action right away and fix it and not let it get out of hand. That's a much better approach. Coming up next week on part two of Nuclear Courtship, we'll head out to two different places named Sagin, both of which are considering allowing a DGR in their territory. It would be instrumental in keeping our, our youth um, within our community. This is stuff that comes out of the ground, uh, uranium. Uh, we're, we're putting it back in the ground. So if you're putting it back, why bother taking it out in the first place? <laughs>